Okay, so let's go to 24. So Sarah has gone to be with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the old of his, of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. All right, so I turned this, uh, I titled this chapter, The Servant, Isaac, and Rebekah. Um, the Bibles usually just say, let's see what mine says. You know how it gives little captions of the title. Mine says, Isaac and Rebekah. But it forgets a key player here, and that's the servant. All right, and it has a lot to do with us. <laughs> and so I'm really going to take my time in teaching this chapter to you guys because I want to, it, it just, it's the Old Testament speaking about the New Covenant. And, and it's really important that we see Jesus in the Old Testament, whether he's in type and shadow or whether he is um, actually there as the angel of the Lord. This chapter is the longest chapter in Genesis and cannot be rushed through as it deals specifically with us and the New Covenant believer in relation to the Father and the Spirit. It will take two to three weeks to complete. So, we see in chapter 22 the sacrifice of the Christ type, Isaac. Right. Then the male lamb that gets put into the thicket with all of its included types, typology. The wood cut by Abraham, right? Father God is the author of the cross. Okay, so while somebody cut a tree and made it into the wood that would be used for a cross, Father God is the author of those men. He, in his providence and in his sovereignty, caused those people to make that cross that would be delivered from that tree that would be delivered to Jesus. And the whole idea is that God is aware of everything. Nothing happens by chance. And that's being pictured by Abraham cutting the wood or uh, getting the wood cut. Isaac carrying his own wood in chapter 22. Well, Jesus carried his own cross, didn't he? Isaac and two young men went with Abraham. Jesus went to the cross in between two young men who were thieves. In chapter 22, it was a three-day journey to Isaac's almost sacrifice and restoration. It was a three-day journey from the cross to the resurrection. Isaac's willingness, he does not argue or fight Abraham as he's putting him on the altar of sacrifice. Jesus was silent as a lamb and went quietly to his death. Abraham's willingness to give his only son in sacrifice, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that all who would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen just so thick in typology of the New Covenant, all right, which is the New Testament. The belief and faith of both in God's plans and purposes. The belief and faith of both Abraham and Jesus in God's plans and purposes. 
The Father and the Son are one. Fully, um, fully convinced that their will will be done, right? Jesus never waffled in his faith and belief. The only thing Jesus did, and you've got to realize it's not waffling, is when he said to God, Father, if it, all, if it be at all possible, let this cup pass before me. But nonetheless, thy will be done when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was not resisting. He was agonizing as a human being of what he is going to be bearing. But he never asked God to, that, he never said to God, I don't want to do this. Right? Or I will not do this. You will have to force me, you know? And then finally, the ram substituted for Isaac. Uh, Abraham lifted the knife up. Isaac, uh, an angel from heaven, said, Abraham, don't do it. Don't do this thing. Now I know that you are fully committed to me and my way. And at that word, they heard rustling in the thicket behind them, and there was a ram, a male lamb, stuck in the thicket. The thicket, Christ had a crown of thorns. And they took the ram and they killed him on the altar. And that introduced the, the, uh, the uh, doctrine called substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement. So now here we are, chapter 24. The servant is nameless. Why would the servant be nameless? Anybody? We know who the servant is. All right, so let me find the verse for you. The servant's name is Eliezer. The servant is nameless, and he is sent by Abraham to get a bride for his son Isaac. All right? The reason why the servant, who is Eliezer, is nameless is because God intentionally is leaving his name omitted because he represents the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what's happening here. All right, so as Abraham sends Eliezer to a pagan land, right? Because he's sending him to Abraham's homeland. Now, he's not sending him to Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham was from. Ur of the Chaldees was in Mesopotamia. That's where he's sending the servant. In Genesis, after they left Ur of the Chaldees, Nahor went with them. And they went part way to a place called um, Heb Hebron. Yeah. No, Haran. Haran. And they yeah. settled there. And then after Abraham's father, Terah, died, Abraham and Lot and company left and continued on because they, were, they weren't called to settle in, what's the name of the place? Haran. 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 Okay. All right. <laughs> I love getting old. All right, so they continue on. But Father God sends the Holy Spirit to hover among a pagan people to find those who will be the bride of Christ. Do you see that? And that is what's being portrayed in this chapter. In detail. And that's what we're going to go over. It's going to be, it, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Um, when you read that, did you get that? Or did you have to... Oh, no, I got that. that. You did? Because I don't see how I would get that. You don't see how? Yeah, like, if I read it, I wouldn't say, oh, gee. Well, okay, let's, let's go this way. Um, could, how far of a stretch do you think it would be for you? And I'm not trying to say this condescendingly or anything, but... What do you think the odds are when you're reading about the, uh, Abraham and Isaac to see the father and the son portrayed in chapter 22? Yeah, yeah. When you explain it, then I see it. Right. Well, you're going to get the same thing here now. But where, why would the Holy Spirit be omitted? Well, I guess I'm, I guess, uh, I'm saying that I should rely on teachers. Well, yeah, no, well, I'm, that's tough because then you can, you can rely on the wrong teacher, you know what I mean? But you can look to other teachers 
to inform you of things you may not necessarily see. Right. And what that will do also is it trains you to start looking f with that kind of view. Now, the pitfall of that is you start seeing symbology in everything. Yeah, sometimes. And then you over-symbolize. Yes. And, you, and, and that, you know what that's called? Allegory. <laughs> Right. And then next thing you know, you have an allegorical interpretation of the entire Bible, even when it's supposed to be just literal, and you, you miss the boat. It's the same thing as money. You know, it's like money isn't sinful until you get it, and then you can go off the, off the rails if you get it, you know. You're going to – and I'm going to explain this, and you're going to see it, and then it, you'll, you're going to have some aha moments here, all right, because this is intense. All right, so um, – I recognize the Holy Spirit and servant. Some of the other things I'm going to read to you, I did not recognize until I read it. And, and then, but the thing, the reason why I was like, whoa, that's true, is because these are all things that I've believed in, but never quite saw in this particular chapter. And I'll explain that to you. So the servant whose name was sent by Abraham, who's a type of the father, to get a bride for his son, Isaac, who's a type of the son. And here, the servant is a type of the Holy Spirit. And so what is so common about what Abraham is doing with his servant, with the New Testament, that would cause us to be in agreement, saying, yeah, he does represent the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus' point in those two scriptures that I read to you is that just as the wind cannot be controlled or understood by human beings, but its effects can be witnessed, so it is also with the Holy Spirit. He cannot be controlled or understood, but the proof of his work is apparent. We are the proof of his work. Changed lives. Man, uh, man, man may choose salvation, but the Spirit must first move before he can choose. Where the Spirit works, there is undeniable and unmistakable evidence. And that goes back to what you were saying before, that, you know, works, and, and you will know them by the f their fruits, right? So the idea that, you know, we are the bride of Christ. Every single one of us sitting here who are saved are titled with the bride of Christ, all right? The only way this bride was brought to Christ was by the Holy Spirit, seeking and finding me. Now, the only reason why he was able to seek and find me and I became a bride of Christ is because I'm elect. The only reason you came to faith in Christ is because you're elect. Before the foundations of the world, he chose you. Right? Glory to God. All right. Okay, so now Abraham was old. He was about 140 years of age. And consequently, that means that Isaac was 40 years old now, being born when his father was 100 years old. And that's Genesis 21 5 and Genesis 25 20. And I'm not going to read those. It's really, well, I'll read 20. Actually, I'll read them both. 21.5. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Cut and dry. Genesis 25.20. 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. All right? So he was 40 years old when he got married. He was not a young pup. But... I guess, you know, if you're living to 130 years old, 125 years old, 140 years old, maybe that is still considered a young pup, right? Who knows? And the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. All right? 
Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All right, what things? Gifts. All right. Looking back, we can agree that Abraham had been through quite a bit. He's traveled through deserts, lied to Pharaoh, kicked out of Egypt, watching the cities of his area wiped out by God, wondering about his nephew Lot and his family, if they're okay, lying to Abimelech, etc., etc., etc. And yet, here we are, and God says, Abraham was blessed in all these things. All right, so I see three points regarding that that are points of encouragement for us. First one, Abraham was a human man like you and I, imperfect and at times sinful. Second, being blessed does not mean being so good, being perfect, as if God will not bless the imperfect but committed. Now, we're all imperfect, Amen. but realize God sees us as perfect because we have Christ's righteousness imputed to us. So he looks past our imperfection because he knows that his spirit is wroughting a work in you called sanctification. But his covenant promise is because you are covered by Christ's righteousness, you will not be damned. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God, right? Amen to that, Third point. That despite Abraham's flaws, the overwhelming character of his life and walk was one of seeking God his will first. And that is my prayer for each one of us tonight. That despite our flaws, despite the fact that you sin once in a while or whatever, that your life, if, if you had to say your life, if somebody looking at you had to say your life was marked by something, it would be your faith in Christ and your walk with him. Okay? So this is all very encouraging to the imperfect believer, to you and I, isn't it? Right? In these ways, we are like Abraham. But we're, we also are not like Abraham in one very key area. God chose Abraham as the human being he would use to begin the covenant promise of the New Testament. The, te the salvation by grace through faith. The covenant of faith was made to Abraham long before Moses was born and gave law. All right? Abraham is special for that reason. We will never be an Abraham. We can be a, an adopted child of God. We will never be a Sarah, ladies. You'll never, there'll never be a Rebecca, never a Rachel, only one of them. These were all people in the lineage that brought us Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are not that. We are progeny of Jesus Christ, born after so they are all unique. So, you know, when, when people tell you you can name and claim the wealth of Abraham because he owned the cattle of a thousand hills, then you can say, oh, I ain't Abraham, and neither are you. All right? Doesn't mean you won't be rich. Doesn't mean you won't be poor. Paul says, be content where you are. Doesn't even mean you don't have to, you, that you can't aspire for more. Just don't be consumed by those aspirations. Be content where you are while you're aspiring for more. All right? All right. And that particular um, group of people that we are, which is the, is the same group as Abraham, has a title in the Old Testament that's also carried over into the New Testament and is used in the book of Revelation. And that is God's peculiar people. God's peculiar people treasure all right and um, this um, what's his name Kenneth Wiest in his word studies if you look up the scripture in I forget where it is in the New Testament where it says that we are a peculiar people of God he he sh shows us that it's in word picture form what that means is there's a circle and you're within that circle and that circle is where all the peculiar people of God are. Every single thing that wants to strike you, whether it's good or bad, from the outside, hits that bubble. And that bubble is called God's permissive will. And it either opens to allow it in, or it does not open 
and stops it. That's the bad and the good. Every single thing that happens to you happens for a reason and a purpose in God's economy. All right? And, you know, and, and so when bad things happen, I mean, I can't begin to tell you, these are all little things, but it really knocked me off my horse yesterday. Um, I, have, I don't even remember, like, like I'm having all this back pain. Then I bit my lip. <laughs> and you know how you keep biting your lip? And I had all these things yesterday happen to me. It was, it was four things. I don't even remember them all now, thank God. That's how important they are. But I felt like, what else? You know? Point being, in the new covenant, we are called as imperfect beings still to a life of devotion and obedience. He covers us in righteousness, and then he says, sinner, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Did you get that? Yes. He covers you in his perfection and then says, sinner, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right, well, I guess I'll work to be perfect, and oh, I failed. Well, there's, there's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I've called you to be perfect, but this isn't like I'm going to abuse you every time you fail. My spirit is changing you. You're not changing you. All I'm calling you to is cooperating with the spirit. It's also clear that this applies for the rich and for the poor, the strong and the weak, high society and low society. We are called to be content in all we have, regardless of our socioeconomic position. Regardless of how much we have, we do not love money as something to covet and are satisfied with our daily bread. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place um, that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Does that sound like a rich man? No. By faith, he went out. Now, it was God's will that he would become uber wealthy. But that's not the case for every single Christian who's ever lived Old Testament to present day. By faith, he went to live in the land. I'm going to start that all over. By faith, Abraham, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And then Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. All right. Oh, here's the verses on Eliezer. So in verse 2, his servant, the oldest of the household, who had charge of all that he had, Eliezer, at 85 years of age, had risen to steward or chief of staff, a position of much authority, indicating his being able to draw freely from Abraham's wealth. That's Genesis 24.10. All right, so... Genesis 15.2 says this. This is God and Abraham having a chat. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. He was his head servant. And by um, tradition, if you did not have a child and you died, your chief servant became your uh, heir. heir. Thank you. All right, and then... It shows us a little later on that the servant did not have to ask Abraham for permission for ten camels and many gifts. A, uh, Eliezer, the servant, just went and got them. 
because he's the chief steward. He got the approval from Abraham to go. He didn't have to run everything by Abraham. All right? That is verse 10 of this chapter. So, had Isaac not been born, Eliezer would have inherited Abraham's wealth. He was he was outcast. I mean, so and um, and Abraham himself stated in fifteen that Eliezer would be his heir. Actually, I don't even know that Ishmael was even born yet. I was just going to say yeah. that. Yeah. All right. So yeah, that's that's the reason. Here, there's a breakdown of the typology with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit never had opportunity to displace Jesus as the heir. All right, because they were always together since time immemorial in all of eternity. So in many ways, this trio, Abraham, Isaac, and the servant, served to illustrate to us the types of the Trinity in their roles and conduct. Obviously, Jesus did not displace the Holy Spirit as the heir of all things after the Father, so the types break down as all types do. David is in a type of Jesus Christ. Well, that breaks down when David has sex with Bathsheba, when he kills her husband, right? So we have to be careful with types. <laughs> but Abraham does illustrate to us the father, Isaac the son, and Eliezer the servant, the Holy Spirit. Rebekah then represents the bride of Christ. First the Jews, then the church. All right, the bride of Christ. First the Jews, then the church. All right, and it's 729. I think we're going to end here because this is a good spot to end, and we'll pick it up next week at chapter at verse 2 of chapter 24. Who'd like to pray us out? Go ahead, brother. Lord, I thank you tonight for the word, Father. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving Pastor Chris the word that we can hear the word from you, Lord. Help us to open our eyes to the word. Open our ears, touch our mind, touch our soul, Father. And I praise you for your goodness and mercy, Father. Give us a safe trip home. And thank you again for the word, Father. Help us to love each other, to pray, to forgive. And help us to continue to grow in you, Father. Get closer and closer to you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody stay seated.